Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chima Konam. Dr. Chima Konam is a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria, South Africa, and a research fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary and Intercultural Philosophy at the University of Tübingen, Germany, and has held positions at the University of Calabar in Nigeria, and was a research associate at the University of Johannesburg. His teaching and research interests cover the areas of African philosophy, logic, environmental ethics, and postmodern, postcolonial, and decolonial thought. Dr. Chima Konam has edited a number of books, including African Philosophy and Environmental Conservation, uh, Rutledge 2017, African Philosophy and the Epistemic Marginalization of Women, Rutledge 2018, co, co edited with Louise Dutois, um, has authored Ezumezu, A System of Logic for African Philosophy and Studies, Springer 2019, New Conversations on the Problems of Identity, Consciousness, and Mind, uh, which was co-authored with Springer in 2019, and the forthcoming uh, book, African Metaphysics, Epistemology, and a New Logic, A Decolonial Approach to Philosophy. This is coming out in 2021, Palgrave. Dr. Chima Konam has won the Jens Jacobsen Research Award for Outstanding Research in Philosophy by the International Society for Universal Dialogue, and recently, was a recipient of University of Pretoria's Exceptional Young Researchers Award in 2021. Without further ado, please let us warmly welcome Dr. Chima Konan, who will be giving the talk titled, The Logic of Decoloniality. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Michael, that was Wonderful, thank you very much. And I also thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, I understand that this is the last of the series. I also thank all those who gave this talk before me. I think I participated in almost all of them and I learned a lot. I also want to thank those who have been able to spare their data to join us from different parts of the world. I hope it's worth it. Okay, so I'll be talking on the logic of decoloniality to the rider towards the bottom of things. Okay, and let me begin immediately. I hope I'm able to get this. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay. Let me begin with the conceptions of coloniality and decoloniality that I've been able to identify in the literature out there. Okay, so the first one is coloniality. I've read in the literature people who have conceived coloniality uh, in a positive sense, all right? Positive as well as negative sense. Positive would include the imposition of uh, metanarrative, imposition of metanarrative. All right, <clears throat> in the sense that the European modernity is here construed as the only, the only viable paradigm, and which, of course, uh, is supposed to be extended to the rest of the world. So, those who are thinking in this direction are thinking that perhaps it's a good thing that they are extending this marvelous, wonderful uh, pertinences of uh, Western modernity. And then the negative sense of it would be those who try to conceive coloniality as a repudiation of autoethnographies. And by autoethnographies, I mean the insider-driven, insider-driven discourse on the nature and perhaps variations, uh, various ramifications of a uh, given cultural formation of knowledge. All right? So there are people who think that coloniality is also is something very bad, morally bad speaking, and because it repudiates the cultural perspectives to knowledge, cultural wisdom, cultural formations, individual uh, uh, beings, and of course, lopsided power relations in different parts of the world, okay? Now, come to decoloniality, I also have two conceptions, positive and negative. I begin with the negative. All right. Some decolonial thinkers uh, see decoloniality as a repudiation of meta narrative. All right. That European modernity that has been imposed. It's just dismantle it, you know, because it shortchanges people from the rest, the other parts of the world. 
Okay, and a perhaps positive aspect of it would read um, the imposition of ethno auto ethnographies. Why is it an imposition? Those that I put under this label are likely going to reject it. <clears throat> but here is the point: the logic that undergirds coloniality. It's also the logic that undergirds that I've seen in the discussions of decoloniality by many people, all right? And that is the classical two-valued logic that really highlights one pair of the binary and residualizes the, the, the other. So if you deploy this logic in discussing decoloniality, and by chance you happen to succeed to accomplish that program, what are you going to have? You're going to establish a new coloniality all right, so in which the formerly, um, the former norm would become normalized and the formerly normalized would become the new norm. All right, so that is the lopsidedness that characterizes the lo that logic, that two value logic. <clears throat> so it's in this light that um, one can interpret that other conception of decoloniality from that angle. And you'd have to confirm this in the literature. A number of people have done that, but I, I, I have identified Walter Mignolo, 20, 2007, page 485, where he talked about the two procedures of decoloniality. Okay, so besides all this, besides all this, there are also some people who are questioning the wisdom and the clarity of decoloniality as a program, okay? Uh, very recently, Raphael Winkler published um, an essay where he clearly questions that and, and, and said some stuff, okay? Um, which I responded to as well and urged him to reconsider his position. I hope he's here today to be further persuaded to reconsider his position I see people like Winkler are those who want to be con convinced. They're classical philosophers. They want to be convinced. He's not convinced. And I hope he's here today uh, so that perhaps he would eventually get convinced that those who've been discussing decoloniality all along have been able to create a mountain of literature that are really, that contain clear and precise explanations and ideas uh, of what they mean by decoloniality. Okay. so. Moving from there, <clears throat> I also identified three strands of decoloniality out there, all right? Three strands. And finding them inadequate, I am here going to propose uh, a fourth strand, which will be my own contribution to the literature. Okay, so the first strand uh, that I've identified in literature is what I call the insider decoloniality, all right? Uh, uh, people who, uh, belong to this category tend to think, you know, from within the border, border of Western modernity, border of European modernity, and they tend to repudiate the structure of that modernity. And some of the people and schools in this category would include postmodernists post like um, Paul Fairband and um, Jean Francois Lautard. Post-structuralists like uh, Michel Foucault, deconstructionists like uh, Jacques Derrida and the rest of them, and even world system theorists like Emmanuel Wallenstein. Then come to the outsider decoloniality. Okay, uh, those who belong to this category tend to think from the outside the border of uh, European modernity. All right, and they tend to uh, strive to repudiate subjectivity and structure as well. And um, uh, some prominent uh, 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 theorists in this regard would include um, Franz Fanon, uh, post-colonialists post like Franz Fanon, uh, Edward Said, Enrique Dussel, uh, Gaia Spivak, Homi Baba, war system theorists like Sam Amin, decolonial thinkers like Anibal Quignano, Walter Mignolo, um, Kwasi Wiredu, uh, Gross Fogel, uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres, and so on and so forth. And then come to the third strand, and this is very interesting, very interesting because I am beginning to notice the emergence of uh, this category of people fairly recently. Okay, these are the category of scholars who need that things from within the border or from outside the border. They tend to think on the border. <laughs> they think, think on the border. 
and <clears throat> and aspire to repudiate subjectivity and structure as well. I will get down to explain some of these concepts in the course of the talk. Um, and, and some scholars in that category would include Leonard Prague as well as Bjorn Freta. All right? Okay, so, but I found these trends really as rich as they are and as, you know, uh, uh, effectively that they, uh, they have marshaled out their thoughts in producing ideas uh, in decoloniality studies, especially in terms of methodology and of course doctrine. There's a gap I see in literature, a gap I see in literature. And that gap is in terms of depth, it's in terms of foundation, it's in terms of logic. All right, coloniality has a logic. If you want to dismantle coloniality, if you want to uh, um, shake up coloniality, you've got to get down to the bottom of things. You've got to get down to the foundation. And, and that is the gap I see in literature that I wish I uh, will make attempt to uh, uh, feel, or at least open up a new vista in that direction. Okay, so before we go down to the bottom of things, right? Uh, Let us refresh our minds about what really this decoloniality entails and why uh, those who work on the area of decoloniality uh, often have to confront the question about the unacceptability of coloniality itself. Okay, what make, makes it morally bad? What makes it evil? Why must we decolonize? Why must we decolonize? All right, and there have been several ideas in literature quite unconnected to the theorization about decoloniality, but which can effectively uh, be brought into suit to justify, to highlight um, uh, decades, if not centuries of pain and experience orchestrated by European modernity that has made decoloniality uh, imperative in this time. All right, and then we have, um, uh, du Bois, who talked about double consciousness, all right? And um, Tempels, who talks about the creation of the evolus in the the human beings that are outside the border, all right? Which Colin King de describes as their raciness. And Fanon talks about that in terms of the colonized intellectual and Antonio Gramsci, uh, talks about it in the with the concept of subaltern, which Spivak eventually borrowed much later uh, uh, in her po post-colonial theorization. And Amos Wilson talks about the falsification of history, which in the first place establishes that line, that borderline, that frontier beyond which there is nothingness. And um, uh, uh, and, and, and C.K. Raju prefers to talk about the. Uh, uh, in uh, the distortion of intellectual history in different disciplines, beginning from mathematics, logic, and the rest of them. And what Jungo talks about the cultural bomb that really is, uh, destroys the cultural appurtenances and epistemic formation of a people leading to linguicide, linguicide. And Anibal Quinjana talks about the lopsided relation of power that, it, uh, 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 that, that, that such European modernity uh, creates. Castro Gomez talks about the zero point perspective, uh, which uh, Grosfo Girl has reformulated as the God's eye view uh, perspective. And then he talks about colonialism as a disease of the mind that those who have been oppressed and who have felt the brunt of Western modernity, uh, unbeknownst to them, suffer, which again affects uh, what they do and, 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 and whom they are, which is exactly the subject of coloniality of being that Maldonado Torres talks about, and the list goes on, which I cannot exhaust. I've uh, made a thought to explain some of these, these uh, ideas in a talk I delivered three days ago at the Satya Nilayam Institute of Philosophy, India. So I will not belabor this so much, but that gives us a perspective, that gives us grounding to understanding why coloniality uh, as a program has to be dismantled, why people, decolonialists, are effectively and aggressively pursuing that cause. Okay, so, but if we are to a kind of summarize uh, the negative effects of coloniality in one word and one sentence to justify the campaign um, for decolonization, decoloniality, what would that be? I've surveyed literature, I've toyed with a lot of concepts and I, I, I settled on difference. 
I settled on different for a purpose. The reason I settled on difference is that it makes a lot of meaning to the supporters of coloniality, promoters of coloniality in Western modernity. It also makes is something that also makes a meaning to do in border thinking for those who are uh, outside the border, all right? Those who are the fringes, the margins of this world and what have you. And foundationally, it makes a whole lot of meaning because the source of the idea of difference um, is logic as well, okay? So, but the difference I talk about here is not the colonial difference. All right, it is the different that is interpreted as inferior, but the difference that is interpreted or translated as variety. Okay, difference that is translated as variety, um, um, which is what Western modernity wants to stifle or strangle. Sarah Pabehan talks about um, the universality that the cloak of universality that Western modernity had adorned itself. All right, the ultimate voracious buttress, as, as he puts it, which Jans, Bruce Jans describes as a pretension of Western intellectual formation. And Innocent Asuzo uh, cautions uh, using his principle of truth and authenticity criterion that no world immanent missing link should ever uh, elevate itself to an absolute instance. All right, but that again is what. Uh, border thinking uh, theories are trying to highlight as uh, part of what makes coloniality uh, evil, diabolic, and the reason why it must be dismantled. So difference does not translate to inferiority. It translates to variety, and variety is the seat of identity, all right, both individ at individual and cultural levels. And um, so we should decolonize partly in defense of difference as variety. As Gramsci captures it in his prison notes, uh, especially the one on cultural hegemony that talks about the, those who've been excluded from the hegemonic cultures um, uh, of the totalitarian regime in Italy from a Marxist perspective altogether as a subject of another day. And um, M. Cesar, in his um, letter to Maurice Torres, the then Secretary General of the French Communist Party, also, uh, in tendering his resignation, uh, criticized the French communist ideology that is bent on uh, elevating the Western idea to the universal and literally discounting the ideas of other people who are non-French, but who are also part of the same establishment of French Communist Party. All right, uh, insisting that the universal should be constituted uh, from diverse particularities. All right, um, which again is something that um, Enrique Dussel has been pursuing since 1977 when he published his book on philosophy of liberation. All right, um, talking about the, the, the understanding that reason is not, uh, is something that manifests in different cultures and should be liberated from the captivity of West European modernity. All right, and um, Walter Mignolo and Gross Foguel also, again, uh, talks about, in talking about colonial difference, uh, tends to contrast uh, the um, ideology of the few politics of knowledge and um, ego politics of knowledge on the one hand, with the geopolitics of knowledge and the body politics of knowledge on another hand. Time permitting, we'll talk about some of these concepts. But that uh, gives us grounding to understand um, how difference you can actually factor in different places, different uh, sides of the border for those who want to approach uh, some of these the colonial ideas from the uh, border uh, thinking perspective. So like I said, difference is in the logic, all right? If you want to establish traces, you've got to trace it down to, to logic. And that is why uh, I have put up this condensed idea before you saying that in theorizing decoloniality, we can say a lot about a lot of interesting things about the subject, but if we haven't said anything about its logic, then we haven't said anything about its depth. Okay, so the potency of the poison of coloniality, ladies and gentlemen, is in its depth. It's in its depth. It's in, it's in its logic. Okay, because modernity uh, is designed with a certain logical backbone. And, 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 and all 
the appurtenances that have characterized modernity or that have grown forth from it are all grounded in that same logic and given force okay, from, uh, by that logic. So uh, one of the ways that we can get to understand the place of foundation in decolonial thinking is to proceed from method, all right? When we ask the question, how should we decolonize, for example? And um, there are many um, opinions and um, proposals in the literature. Some have actually come from outside uh, the uh, decolonial studies itself, okay? But again, things that uh, we can look at and say these ideas can fit in. All right, and I'm just going to point uh, broadly different ideas that people have um, espoused, All right? Jahan's Jan and um, just uh, Bogmi Jusiski talk, both of them talk about what they call the valuable integration of valuable past with relevant modernity, okay? Integration of usable past with relevant modernity respectively. And Amilcar Cabral, the Guinean nationalist, um, um, urged us to return to the source. Where did it all begin? Where is that source? That might be political, it can also be cultural, um, um, as the case may be, to retrace our steps, steps, see what we can do for ourselves with what we have and, and, and how we can resolve our problems, you know, even though in partnership with others you know, across the line. And um, Enrique Dussel talks about Transmodernity, all right? In his um, work where he engaged the postmodernist Giovanni Vatimo, uh, he tried to uh, suggest that what the postmodernists are doing now is okay, now okay, but not enough. Not enough because they are internal critics, and internal critics don't feel the pain as external critics would, all right? And additionally, that modernity had. Uh, uh, ceased being a European phenomenon alone. It now sucks every part of the world in. So it's also a global phenomenon, which means that those who are worst affected by modernity uh, will definitely and should uh, be a part of the critique or effort to dismantle modernity. So brought out the concept of transmodernity to characterize all of those things. And um, world system theories like Wallenstein and Amin also you know, join from that perspective recommending uh, their own um, ideas as well. I mean, specifically, um, give us the idea of delinking, all right? Uh, uh, in trying to tackle issues such as this, like attempting to decolonize, we've got to come from a global system, understand that the world works like a system now. And, and that system has sucked in those who are um, who were formerly colonized, all right, and subsumed and subjected to the that paradigm, um, making it difficult for them to really uh, grow economically, uh, politically, and otherwise. And that there's a need for them to delink from that world system. They've got to delink, not in terms of establishing some form of cultural autarky, of course, but in terms of really finding their own solutions, uh, solutions that respond to the questions that arise in their places, you know, instead of being really controlled and spoon fed from, from, you know, uh, the, from our side, all right? And this same concept of delinking is, again, is something that uh, Anibal Quignano was also working on at the same time. You know, it's really funny how um, language barrier could really affect research, affect research, even though, uh, I mean, published his book in 1985 uh, in French using the concept of la déconnexion, all right? Uh, it was upon translation in 1990 that the linking was used for that concept. But Anibal Guignano was also working on this same thing, okay? In Spanish, with the concept he calls um, desprendes and uh, desprendimiento, all right? It's a kind of, a, again, disconnecting, dis connecting from that world system that really represses, suppresses, you know, jinxes you, holds you firm, determines your movements, and ensures that you are not really growing as you should, okay? And also, of course, recommends complementary reflection as an idea is when we decolonize and dismantle, let's just think about harvesting what is good and relevant from both sides and then complement, let's just be a complementary thing. 
And John Frenta talks about disinferiorizing on this other side of the border and um, deinferiorizing on the other side of the border. These are all ideas can somehow be brought in into the equation of decoloniality and, uh, and, and a host of other ones. But as soon as we talk about decoloniality or how we should decolonize, we are again, we discover that we again led back to um, the question of, of the cause of coloniality. You've got to know what causes something you want to decolonize. You've got to know the source. If you don't know the source, you probably would have to be beaten about the bush. All right, so it's important we know the source. And, and, and some people, you know, reading the literature out there, you get the impression that most people are thinking, okay, coloniality is caused by colonialism. Coloniality is a product of mo European modernity. Coloniality is it's virtually all the same, but that's not the view I hold. I look at the whole thing, the whole collection and cluster of concepts, and I think they are all hanging together and they all have the same source. They all have the same cause. Yeah, colonialism may provide impetus for neocolonialism, but not in the sense of metaphysical notion of cause and effect. All right? So uh, it, 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 it can easily be deceptive when we think that colonialism causes coloniality, it causes neocolonialism, is the cause of imperialism and, and so on and so forth. Or even taking a step back that modernity causes all this, all right? I think these things are principal tropes hanging together with the same cause. And what is that cause? I believe it is the logic of difference. The logic of difference, difference translated as inferior. That is the two value logic, two classical value logic that Aristotle formulated in um, 300 years BC, some 300 years BC, in his prior analysis and posterior analytics, respectfully, all right? And it is, it is, it's a logic that highlights a logic of binary opposition, that highlights one pair of that opposition and residualizes the other. That is why the two opposed, two um, um, polar values in the two value logic, you know, are true and false. Truth and false, falsity, yeah, as the case may be. And you discover that the, 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 when you begin to analyze propositions, evaluate them by these two polar values, you discover that um, there is something that is missing somewhere. For example, you can analyze a proposition in two value logic as either true or false. All right, that's, that's law of excluded middle. That's something that is excluded in that middle. It means there's no intermediate position. It is definitely this, either definitely this or definitely that. All right, and that is too restrictive. Whereas that can engender a lot of precision, it also loses a lot by way of scope, okay? Which accounts for the limitation of that uh, logic. And of course it has very, you know, very sad consequences when you begin to uh, deploy that logic in human relations, in economy, economic terms, and, and in education, most importantly. Uh, and that is part of uh, why um, you discover that colonialists, when they arrived in different places to do their business and all that, they did not look at those people as fellow humans in the journey of life, no, okay? And because it is them, you know, and, and, and the rest, all right, and, and they are really the, 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 those that matter, those that count, and the rest must be discounted. So it is a logic that highlights the other pair of the binary and residualizes the other. Inevitably, that is how it is. And when you deploy this logic in a system of education, people are going to grow up, you know, that way. Uh, some people think of Western worldview as individualistic. It's also something they are trying to capture from their own perspective and understanding. So this logic underlies all of these things. Modernity was constructed and um, uh, constructed, constructed to draw that sort of border uh, that uh, accommodates those who belong and those who do not belong out there, all right? Because of that logic, that is the mind view that that logic gives you. And logic um, uh, is something that, back, that grounds methods. And methods are the, 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 the outline, the plan, the, 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 the procedure that we uh, you know, tap into to do whatever we want to do. And so they shape our view of life. They shape our understanding of uh, virtually everything. 
And that is the logic that runs coloniality. You cannot be to dismantle coloniality still using and thinking within the framework of that same logic. It's not really going to work successfully. If you in practice succeed in dismantling that coloniality, you're only going to establish a new coloniality. And that is what you see in international politics and diplomacy. It's always about a winner takes it all, but it doesn't mean that that's the only logic we have. There are other ways to reason and think. And, um, uh, and, and that is what I am going to uh, demonstrate in this work. So when you look at the demo you have there about these logics to spare you the technicalities of that logic, when you, like I said, um, if you are evaluating a proposition in terms of true and false, for false, and, and you say that um, that proposition is either true or false, law of excluded middle, if it is false, then it cannot be the case that it is true, that is law of contradiction, if it is true, then it is true, law of identity, okay? So there's that lopsidedness. It is strict, it guarantees precision, which is really its advantage, but then it has a lot of implications and terrible effects when deployed in human activities, in education and human relationships, economy, and what have you. And look at the demo before you, both of them are the same thing. The one on the left is... Um, uh, vertical, the one on the right is horizontal. So let's think about so that you would understand the uh, unequal binary that this logic establishes. Okay, think of the values true and false. What variable do you have on that true? Male. What variable do you have on that uh, false? Female. Okay, now think about the gender inequalities, the inequalities and marginalizations and um, subordinations we, we witness nowadays in terms of gender, in terms of um, Oh, uh, sorry, it appears my face is that. In terms of gender, in terms of um, uh, sexuality and what have you. And you discover, Ray, this is coming from this logic. Think of European and African, all right? One is true, one is false. That's, that's lopsidedness. Think of presence and absence. It is the same thing, all right? In fact, deconstructionists like Jacques Derrida have tried to demonstrate really how this binary, unequal binary opposition affects and determines and really causes some of the problems we have in the world, okay? For example, they talk about presence uh, if they want to apply it to a concrete case like a human being. They said that um, a male is an individual in whom there is a presence of phallus, all right? That's a presence of penis in the male. What about the female? It's an individual in whom there is an absence of phallus. It's an absence of penis. So the vagina is residualized. It is not something important. It is just a sign for an absence. All right. And, 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 and I did not really, I read it, I understood this some years ago, but I did not really have the impact of it until one day I was traveling as this ancient cathedral in Europe. It must be Austria or something. And it was a tourist zone. And I was there and I was looking at the church, uh, the cathedral in front of it, outside, okay, the pillars, two pillars by the two doors of the cathedral. On top of the, the, the one of the pillars, you see fellows there, okay? You see the male organ molded there. And then on top of this other one, it's virtually like absence, all right? You see something there, but the image that strikes you immediately is that of absence. It's not that of a vagina, it's that of ab absence. All right, so that is how the power of binary um, opposition and on the core binary opposition, which the two value logic really introduces. Okay, so it is important therefore for us to get down to the bottom of things when we are talking about decoloniality and indeed the other sundry fields, we've got to get down to the bottom of things, all right, where we ought to start. And, um, and that is logic. All right, it is true that some decolonial thinkers like Mignolo and even war system theorists like Amin have in their various writings talked about logic of coloniality, logic of war, capitalist expansion. But in reading them, you do not really see them articulate that classical two value logic as such. They are virtually talking about this logic as a mindset. Oh yes, it's all part of it. But it's important that we identify that system of logic as a foundational structure that grounds um, 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 uh, some of these principal tropes that really affect uh, humanity and the world, you know, at, at large. And, and, and so 
But again, you have to say that some of these uh, decolonial thinkers and philosophers are joining late in that debate anyways, uh, have not been, um, they're not philosophers. Some of them are sociologists, anthropologists, area studies specialists, and, and what have you, all right? Um, and, and, and of course, there are there's a very recent collection, very recent collection I would recommend to anyone, edited by my very good friend, Veli Mitova, okay, last year, and which was approaching the discourse from the dimension of um, uh, epistemology, epistemic decolonization, and was quite rich and contributes to the discourse, you know, immensely. However, again, you notice the really almost near absence of, you know, thinking in depth, going to the foundation, getting down to the bottom of things, all right? So you see, you know, prevalent in literature on decolonization, ideas that are, and, and, and proposals that are pursuing methodological and doctrinal approaches to decoloniality, uh, and very little, if any, you know, to the best of my knowledge that are really getting down to the bottom of things, the logic of decoloniality. There are two logics that are involved here. When you talk about the logic of coloniality, that's something that you have to dismantle. You have to also think about the logic of decoloniality that will, again, effectively replace it and engender a system that will not, again, repeat the cycle of coloniality and, um, and they colonize, as the case may be. And that is um, um, what I bid to do here. So perhaps I should distract you a bit uh, and tell you that even the famous Sarge in the popular movie series, Star Trek, also supports my proposal. Can you imagine that? Captain Spock says that logic is the beginning of wisdom. All right? And um, uh, uh, um, and again, except that he says it's not the end of wisdom. All right? It's the beginning of wisdom, Valerius, not the end of it, which, again, is what I disagree with him. Uh, Captain Spock made his name by being logical and rose to the ranks, all right? A great man, a logician, had a lot of admirers, including Valerius, the young lieutenant. But at a point, at a crisis, a great crisis point in the affairs of the Federation, uh, Captain Spock uh, reached the limit of his logic, the two value logic, all right? He could not find valid premises to deduce his conclusions anymore. And he declared that it is maybe the beginning, but not the end. But logic is both the beginning and the end. The problem is when you have a system, and that is what I try to um, condense here in thinking of talking about the expressive powers of different systems of logic, all right? If there is a structure which existing systems of logic cannot express, there is always another system that can. We just have to invent it, all right? We just have to invent it. And folks, logicians like Kanaf supports this agenda insofar as the semantic and the uh, syntactic principles and rules of that such a system is properly formulated. And Riza, of course, uh, contributes by saying that that again would require tweaking the laws of thought, but it's perfectly in order. It's all up, it's perfectly in order. But we are, however, so used to the, uh, uh, um, the European modernity that structures everything, social life, science, economic, political, rest basis, all of them on the foundation of two-value logic, making it look as if there cannot be any other logic, all right? And when we reach the zenith of this logic, we, 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 we tend not to know what else to do. And, 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 but Hilbert tells us that the power of human reason is immense. In a talk he delivered before the World Mathematical Congress in Paris in 1900, he talked about the axiom of solvability of every problem. He calls it an axiom. It demonstrates his conviction that any problem a human mind sets at can be you know, resolved, given sufficient resources and time. And, and I believe that, you know, and these were the motivations behind my formulation of um, um, Izume's logic, all right? Um, okay. Um, in, in all, because of that, if uh, uh, in formulating a new knowledge, a new logic, uh, to replace the logic of coloniality would, of course, affect our conception uh, of decoloniality, such that instead of a repudiation of ideologies, 
right? Western modernity repudiating cultural formations and all the other people trying to repudiate. It's a conflict, it's a clash, it's a puzzle to know which one succeeds. Winner takes it all. It doesn't have to be that way. So instead of that sort of conception, which I painted at the beginning of this talk, we can actually have um, a conception of decoloniality that sees it as an authentication of what ethnographies towards the complementarity of opposites, where um, different autoethnographies, including the Western itself, is you know presented and captured as what it is. It's again another cultural formation, all right. And um, uh, but the emphasis there is on the word authentication. By that I do not mean endorsing. I do not mean validating. You know, I mean a process that involves three dimensions of thoughts. Okay, the architectural, the doctrinal, and the foundational, and that leads me to the fourth strand of decoloniality, because to uh, assemble all of these new ideas requires another strand of decoloniality, which I call conversational decoloniality. Here's the first one, my proposal, fourth one, my proposal, all right? And I, I, I contrast with the other three uh, strands in that, uh, unlike the other three strands, it's not, it's not a thinking within or or uh, outside the border, or even on the border. He said, non-border thinking, so to speak, all right? But there are nuances between this and the border thinking that some people who are extending critical theory into critical border thinking, you know, have in mind. That's not what I have in mind here, all right? Again, uh, unlike the second and the third concept strands, it does not repudiate subjectivity. No, because humanity is the same everywhere. It, 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 that's, that's humanity in the person of A has done some terrible things to the humanity in the person of B it does not mean uh, destroying the humanity in the person of A, all right? Why don't we think of really getting down to the bottom of things where this whole uh, mistake started from in the beginning, okay? Again, um, it authenticates autoethnographies and it's characterized by architectural thinking, doctrinal thinking, and foundational thinking. And, and it's based on three valued logic, okay? Which has two glots in the middle. What was excluded in the law of excluded middle has now been returned in the law of non-entity that serves as a supplementary law to this uh, new system of logic that I and some other people are promoting, okay? So, um, um, and, and, and I can demonstrate, yes, that structure of Izumi's logic, which is a three value logic. And you can contrast this, what you have before you, with what um, I demonstrated earlier concerning two value logic. All right. So you can see there's a middle position there. And that middle position, uh, let's just even begin with the two polar values, truth and falsehood, Ezu and Izu. The understanding of Ezu and Izu is not precisely as the understanding of truth and falsehood in their strictness, in their strict terms. No, here they are independent uh, values, but somewhat fractional, such that they are ten whole in, in, in the middle, all right, in Ezu Mezu, where it is a truth glut, not a truth gap. And which means they complement instead of binary contradiction. Here we're talking about ban binary complementarity. All right. And, and it is this logic that, um, as I bid to conclude, it is this logic that uh, we can uh, deploy when we have uh, dismantled the logic of coloniality by demonstrating that there's something missing, there's something not right about the logic that undergirds modernity, that logic that. It grounds coloniality, it grounds colonialism, imperialism. It's always a it's always a divisive, polarizing, dichotomizing logic. All right. When we demonstrate that and dis and displace it, and we replace it, we bring in its place. It's amazing logic as as, 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 as as a system that can do better, really. All right. And in deploying that, uh, as we get to the bottom of things, in deploying that we have a new strand of decoloniality we call conversational uh, decoloniality, okay? With three dimensions of decolonial thinking, the architectural that refers to method, method of method, 
You know, we've got to decolonize. We have to decolonize method. You can use the method that enthroned coloniality and, 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 and hope to have something new. Method shapes ideas, methods shape doctrine. It's important that it is decolonized. And people are doing that already. There are different ways. All right. So the architectural represents method. And the doctrinal represents uh, the ideas and theories that people weave here and there. And you can see how it departs from the uh, vertical double, uh, uh, double headed arrow uh, that I used to represent the architectural uh, dimension, showing that method is what shapes doctrine, but beneath is foundation. That's logic. Because method, the method rests on a logic. All right. That is why if you come to a system, you can only have one logic under, under guarding a given system, but you can have many methods, you know, which represents different ways of um, articulating or expressing the laws of that very logic. And then you have um, doctrine that can be shaped by these other different methods. All right. Those, those who have interest in understanding these three dimensions of uh, decolonial thinking, I invite you to join the talk I'll give tomorrow uh, at the University of Tübingen in Germany. It's one of the ideas that I will explore uh, in that talk. But permit me to uh, uh, tell you by way of summary that to decolonize effectively, we have to uh, get down to the bottom of things. And that is logic. Thank you very much. I'll pause here, take your questions, criticisms, and um, contributions, as the case may be, I thank you all. I appreciate you all for coming out, sparing your data to listen to me, and of course, um, the organizers for inviting me uh, for this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.